to another episode of Fully Charged News. Now, have a look at this, because this is kind of interesting. <coughs> now, <laughs> what I'm holding in my hand might look like something that a horse left that your grandma wants to put on her roses, but it's not. No, that is a polymetallic nodule. Well, some of you might have heard the Fully Charged Show podcast uh, uh, that I did with Gerard Barron, who runs a company called Deep Green. And Deep Green sent me this, a polymetallic nodule that was lifted from 4,000 metres beneath the surface of the Pacific Ocean, a thousand miles from the nearest land. Now, if you haven't discovered the Fully Charged Show podcast, I'll put a link beneath this, but it is very popular and we're getting amazing people on it as guests. So I'm really, really thrilled with that. So uh, Deep Green. Deep Green is this company that are developing uh, the technology to extract these nodules from the seabed. There are literally, literally billions of these uh, uh, on certain parts of the Pacific Ocean floor at just mind-boggling depth. So they're developing the machinery that can extract them. Why are they bringing up lumps of black stuff from the bottom of the ocean? Well, very simply, this dark lump is 99% usable minerals. That's a lot of percent. That's kind of all of the percents there are, except for one. So this is made of nickel, it's made of copper, it's made of cobalt, as well as traces of other rare earth metals such as molybdenum, molybdenum, it's kind of hard to say that one, loads of other rare earth ele elements and lithium. So it's all in these lumps. So now clearly, clearly, I'm not going to go any further without mentioning that lowering large mining equipment machines 4,000 metres into the deep ocean to pick up nodules is going to be a contentious activity. There's no question of that. And there's plenty of people already saying we can't do this, this is ridiculous. And there's, if you listen to Jared, there is not a huge amount of life down there. And what they're doing is not digging stuff up. These are on the surface. They're literally scraping them off the surface. And nothing, nothing lives in these. Two key things are, which I think one of the fascinating things that Gerard said is, you know, as a mining engineer, someone who extracts the minerals that we need to make the things that we use in this world, we've got to stop mining, digging, digging stuff up on this earth. We've got to stop by 2050. And from then on, we must use everything we've got again and again. We need to develop a circular economy. And that is a massive, complicated challenge. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not impossible. And it's becoming increasingly possible. One of the areas that it is impossible is with burning fossil fuels. Really hard to burn it twice. But just compare a, a, a subsurface mining machine. We're going to go and try and see it. There is one uh, that we can go and have a look at at some point when we're allowed. Uh, but um, when, you, when you see what they're doing there and you compare that with the open cast mining that we use today, massive deep pits in the earth where there's thousands of massive diggers scraping up rocks and they put it on the big trucks and they drive up to the top and they, they uh, refine it. Generally, it's 1% of that material that they dig up contains the elements that we're looking for, 1%. So you dig up 100 tonnes of rock and you transport it to the surface on dozens of big trucks and then you get one tonne of actual usable material out of it. And that's normal, that's considered good. That's a, an economically viable way of dealing with things. Well, what you're doing is creating vast holes in the world, taking off mountains, you know, really, really big impact. Whereas this stuff, you dig this up, 99% of it is usable. There are billions of them on the ocean floor. There is enough to make literally billions of electric car batteries out of the materials that are there, which obviously we never do because there's not enough other materials, but we, there's enough to make a huge amount of batteries, electric motors, all the things that we're, we're, we're talking about on this, on this show. Anyway, if you want to learn more, it's well worth listening to that episode of the podcast. Now, we've had a comprehensive coverage from China recently. Um, caused a little bit of a stir, not really. It's kind of boring. But um, I thought it only fair to balance that with cars that come from other countries. Russia, for example. Now, I can honestly say we have never mentioned a Russian car on Fully Charged ever in the 10 years we've been doing it. But surprise, surprise, a Russian electric car has just been announced. The serial production of the Zeta. Russia's first electric car is to be launched in the city of Togliati uh, in late 2020, late this year. Uh, 
Zeta is the first mass-produced, this is a production car, it's not a one-off, this is a mass-produced production car. It can travel up to a speed of 120 kilometers per hour. Impressive. It will cost 450,000 rubles, which is about six grand in dollars, or 4,000 pounds, or 4,500 euros at current exchange rate, somewhere around the area, cheap. That's what's interesting about it. I'm, you know, I'm not going to, sure if we're ever going to be able to test drive this car. I don't know if it's ever going to come to Western Europe, for instance. I really hope it does. If uh, if anyone from Russia is listening, we'd be fascinated to see it. It's, it's, I'm really impressed. I mean, it is interesting. That this is coming from a country, essentially, whose entire economy is dependent on exporting fossil fuels to the West. You know, it is really uh, oil and mainly gas. So it's a pleasant surprise to see this development. So I thought, yeah, cool. That's, you know, first time we've had a Russian car on fully charged. And then along come two of them. And this second one is a little bit more, let's call it sexy. Now, OK, this is a carbon fiber copy of the first generation Ford Mustang. Now, the original Ford Mustang, I've actually driven one in Los Angeles and it was amazing. And for those of you too young to know this, there was a famous iconic film of the late 1960s called Bullet which starred a man called Steve McQueen, who did all his own stunts. And there is a famous car chase in the film Bullet. Uh, uh, one of the cars involved in the car chase is a F Ford Mustang Fastback 1969. Very nice. It, it makes all the noises that men who love V8s, I'm one of them, loved all that stuff. I'm not going to do my V8 impression now. <clears throat> no, I'm not. <laughs> but anyway, the Russian-based Aviar company explained that they want to catch the spirit of the original Mustang and a rethink it in a modern way. So they're basically using the drivetrain, the batteries, the operating system, everything from a Tesla P100D performance car, but with a different body. They are quoting a 2.2 second naught to 60, which is considerably faster than the vehicle that Mr. McQueen drove in the film Bullet. Uh, 155 mile an hour top speed, uh, 840 horsepower output. So, you know, a high level performance vehicle. It's using carbon fiber exclusively uh, bodywork, which uh, offsets the weight of the very big 100 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. And it allows the R67, as it's called, to tip the scale at 2,100 kilograms, which is about 72 kilograms lighter than the Model S P100D. Just to put that in context, for those of you who are used to pounds or stones, 72 kilograms is sort of an adult, slim adult. I'm a little bit more than that, but there was a time when I would have been about 72 kilograms. When I was about 25. Now... Where the actual batteries, the control systems, the motors and peripheral necessities come from, I know not. I've got no idea. I, if I can find out any more information, I will report it here. And if we ever get a chance to drive that particular Mustang, I don't, I've got almost zero appreciation of uh, automotive design. But I do have a soft spot for the Fastback Mustang. I don't know why. It's just got something about it. Enough about Russia. I mean, anyone would think that I'm sponsored by Vladimir Putin. But then I'm not a member of the British Conservative Party or the American Republican Party, so that's doubtful. No, I just want an ordinary, everyday story about electric vehicles and renewable energy. Just something run-of-the-mill, nothing special or clever. OK, so here we go. The oil giant Shell wants us to stop buying petrol and diesel cars. What the what? Now, it's been quite widely reported that Shell is pushing the UK government to uh, bring the ban on the sale of new fossil uh, uh, fossil fuel vehicles uh, from 2035 to 2030, bring it uh, five years earlier. So in 10 years from now, you can't buy a petrol or diesel car in the UK. This isn't Greenpeace or Extinction Rebellion saying this, this is Shell. One of the oldest and biggest oil companies on earth are stating publicly that we should convert our entire transport fleet to electricity. So let me delve in to the box of uh, the accompanying box of caveats at the moment I don't know if this is the case but it seems to be only specific to the UK I don't think they're saying globally let's stop burning the very product that we extract and refine now to be specific this article was uh, published on LinkedIn by uh, Sinead Lynch uh, who's the UK country chair of Shell uh, and she's suggesting that we need to plan a transition 
to move from fossils to electrons. Uh, we need to see a huge increase in the availability of public charging and, and, and continued support for drivers to transition from fossils to electric. And to be fair, Shell are involved in doing this. So there are now numerous Shell filling stations, gas stations, petrol stations, call them what you will, that have uh, rapid charges and they're installing a lot more. And I'm trying to find out exactly where. So they announced a while ago that they're going to have a charging hub they were going to take an existing uh, shell filling station uh, i think it's in within london somewhere around in london uh, they're going to completely refurbish it to just electric car charging um, and I'm, so i'm trying to find out where exactly where it's located and when it's going to be open so i would imagine its opening has been delayed by the current climate um, now i recently visited a development of a major and i do mean a major charging hub that we're filming an episode about i don't want to tell you anything about it yet it's still under wraps it's not finished yet but believe me it is amazing it is game changing it is awesome it is incredible what they're doing so that's an episode that will come later on this year uh, and another story about car charging uh, now this is just uh, from bloomberg new energy finance they like to keep their eye on things like this The number of public charge points around the world has clicked above the one million mark. The important bit is that the number of charges around the world has doubled in the last three years. So, so, so from none in like 2006, no, let's take, okay, 1999, kind of basically none, to however many, half a million in, uh, in, in uh, 2017. And now there's a million. So it's... I think you, if you did that graphy thing, it would be flat, 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 going up, up, and then it would be pretty impressive. Most of this new infrastructure, of course, guess where it is? It's in China. The second most uh, common place is in Europe, and really uh, lagging behind somewhat is the United States of America. China just remains the most aggressive on jump-starting its electric vehicle economy. So more than half the world's charge points, now uh, over half the world's solar panels are all installed in China, which is where they make them. So, you know... There's a big, there's a lot of debate going on about that whole thing. Uh, the European Union recently announced a goal of one million public charges in uh, Europe by 2025. Now, even General Motors in America has finally decided to invest in public charging stations in the USA, a mere 24 years after they introduced their first electric cars. Those legacy automakers, you know, they are so quick off the mark, aren't they? <laughs> Make a decision. Boom! 24 years later, actually do something. Anyway, let's go on a slightly more positive story. Toyota. Yes, the originators of the self-charging hybrid. Brilliant piece of breakthrough technology, that is. Uh, well, as we saw, uh, we've already seen from our Southeast Asia correspondent, Elliot, Toyota are already making 100% electric cars, which they're selling in China by the shed load. But they are also working on solid-state batteries and have announced that they expect these to hit the market in a commercial way in five years' time. Now, what is a solid-state battery? Well, solid-state batteries uh, replace the liquid electrolyte that, are in, that is in all batteries at the moment with uh, a solid material, hence the name. So they're completely solid, there's no liquid in them. All the developments indicate that these will offer far greater energy density than the current battery technology we're using now. Now, Toyota are already running vehicles with these batteries in them as test vehicles, uh, and the results are clearly very impressive, impressive enough for them to continue developing them. Solid state batteries will allow for far greater, like we're talking double the energy density of current batteries but the same size and weight so these batteries that uh, toyota is testing at the moment they uh, can charge from nothing completely flat to completely full in 15 minutes which is impressive in itself uh, they, they uh, toyota are claiming that the capacity loss is just 10 over 30 years so you're looking at a million mile plus battery which will outlast the car and can be used again in all other forms it's you know this is this is the kind of energy dense energy storage breakthrough we want And as I said, these new batteries will literally double energy capacity. So if you imagine a car today uh, with a 50 kilowatt hour battery, and the size and shape of that battery, exactly the same today with these batteries, it could have a 100 kilowatt hour battery. So we are looking at cars in five years time that could have between 400 and 800 mile ranges, quite realistically, that could recharge in 15, 20 minutes. VW, Samsung, LG Chem, Dyson, they're all working on commercializing uh, uh, and manufacturing solid state batteries right now. And just to end on a high, a recent report out in the UK shows that electric car sales have increased this year 
during lockdown by 250% over the same period as last year. So more and more people do not want to buy inefficient, clanky, dirty, noisy, old internal combustion engines. They want to buy electric cars. It's pretty painfully obvious. So there is the demand there. The car makers are beginning to finally pick up on it. There is the demand. People do want to buy these cars. They are better than the rubbishy, clanky old ones that you're trying to flog us at the moment. So pull your fingers out, pull your socks out and get to it. Anyway, that's all I've got time for. Loads of other stories. I'm going to do them for another show. Uh, I just want to quickly thank a handful of wonderful Patreon supporters who uh, support us with $10 a month or more. And this is what keeps Fully Charged on the road. Here they come. The Plug Seeker. Mike Barrett. Brennan Dew. Stephen O'Donoghue, Tony Olshanksy, Jamie Easton Wise, Anton and Nader, Gemma Charlton, Christine Burns, thank you Christine, Rick Wilkinson, Martin Ford, Paul Veal, John Pettinger, Nicola Worthington, Mike Appagelati, Andrew Waldron, Rob Tungman, Bernie Murphy, Daniel Vogueres, and Graham Shapcott. Thank you so much. For your generosity really truly hugely appreciated not going to go on about it i might get teary uh, that's all for this week uh, please do subscribe to fully charged have a look at the patreon link that's beneath this video uh have a look at the um, uh, youtube memberships and uh, as always if you have been thank you for watching